right, so we're still talking about the radial solutions to the uh, hydrogen atom wave function, the radial portion of the solutions. And what we've seen so far is that the function e to the minus some constant times r is a solution to the radial portion of the Schrodinger equation. And we determined that what the, that constant was is the uh, atomic number divided by this collection of constants that we've called the Bohr radius. So this function e to the minus z r over a naught is a solution to the Schrodinger equation. And in fact, if I stick any constant I want out in front of that equation, it will still be a solution to the Schrodinger equation. Um, and, and you won't be surprised to learn that that n turns out to be related to what will turn into a normalization constant in the near future. So that's one solution to the Schrodinger equation. You also won't be surprised to hear that there's a large number of solutions. Even for the uh, L equals zero uh, wave function, uh, w this was a solution to the L equals zero portion of the radial wave function. Even for the L equals zero portion, there's more than just this one solution. So, uh, and we end up numbering those. So this is, uh, when, when L equals zero, the one solution that we've obtained so far, I'm gonna name that the R10 uh, radial function. That looks like N times, uh, let me leave a blank there, E to the minus ZR over A naught. That product is a solution to the Schrodinger equation, or the radial portion of the Schrodinger equation. There's a second solution that we could consider, and we went through all the math of confirming that this is in fact a solution, but the second solution to the L equals zero radial wave function, radial Schrodinger equation that we'll call R two zero is a different normalization constant, again multiplied by the same exponential I'm sorry, it's actually multiplied by a slightly different exponential, e to the minus zr over 2 a naught, and also an extra term a polynomial term that involves r. So 2 minus z times r divided by a naught. So that new function uh, exponential times this polynomial also turns out to be a solution to the Schrodinger equation, the radial portion of the Schrodinger equation. And there's an infinite series of these, and there's also a whole different set of solutions, not when L equals zero, but when L equals one, and when L equals two, and so on. So if we pause for a second to uh, uh, write out some more of these candidate solutions in just a second. So, as I said, there's a whole infinite series of these solutions. When L equals zero, there's an n equals one, n equals two, n equals three solutions. Any one of these, if we plugged it into the radial version of the Schrodinger equation, we could confirm that these equations each solve uh, that, equa that differential equation. For the L equals one version of the radial Schrodinger equation, there's an n equals two, n equals three, and so on, whole set of those. And I've got only one example here for the L equals two function. But the point is there's this very large family of, of solutions to the radial version of the Schrodinger equation. And if we look carefully, we can see some things they have in common. If we look at what this radial solution to the Schrodinger equation looks like, it always has e to the minus z times radius divided by the uh, Bohr radius. But sometimes it's divided by 1 a naught, or 2 a naught, or 3 a naught. And that's, in fact, the, the reason we label them n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n tells us the uh, how many Bohr radiuses we divide by in the exponential. So that's, for example, why we started counting from n equals two rather than n equals one uh, for these solutions is because the first solution has e to the minus zr over two a naught, and the next one has e to the minus zr over three a naught. So we call that the n equals two solution, the n equals three solution. So the exponential always has e to the minus zr over n copies of a naught. There's also always a normalization constant out front. That normalization constant, I've labeled them all n, but if we calculate the actual values of those, those are different uh, normalization constants for every one of these functions. And then the polynomial portions of these functions, which I've written in green, we can see some patterns there also. Sometimes it's a polynomial function like these. Sometimes that polynomial function is preceded by a, a ratio of zr over uh, a naught with some constants thrown in. So that term, if we look carefully, looks like uh, 2 zr 
over n a naught. Sometimes, so that's the term like this one, that's 2zr over 2 a naught, 2zr over 3 a naught, 2zr over 3 a naught. So it's always 2zr over the n uh, a naught terms. That's either raised to the first power when l equals 1, or it's raised to the second power when l equals 2, or it's missing entirely when l equals 0 because it's raised to the 0 power. So that term is raised to the lth power. And then there's this other more complicated polynomial term that involves constants zr over a naught, z over, r, over a naught squared, and so on. So for now, we'll just write that as some polynomial function of r, which again is going to depend on the specific values of n and l. We'll talk more about that in the future, but that's some uh, additional uh, polynomial function of r. So this is the general form of each of these radial solutions of the Schrodinger equation. The one thing left that we have to comment on these is what values of L, n and l we should expect to find solutions for. l, you'll recall, is the exact same l that we've had in the rigid rotor Schrodinger equation. So we know that the value of l can be any non-negative integer. l can be 0, 1, 2, and so on. What we see here is that when l equals 0, the value of n can be 1 or 2 or 3 or larger values. When l equals 2, the, the smallest value of n we're allowed to have is n equals 2. Uh, I'm sorry, when l equals 1, n must be 2 or 3 or some higher value. When l equals 2, then n can be 3 or higher. So that pattern persists. So whatever the value of l is, n can be one larger than that or larger integers still, but it can't be as small as l or anything below. Usually, uh, uh, we, we don't think of the, the rules in this form. We think of them instead as in the following form. n, as you see here, n can be any positive integer. It's possible for n to be 1 or 2 or 3. There are no values of n uh, equals 0, and that's because if we had a 0, e to the minus 0 over 0 uh, a naughts, uh, then that would uh, not be possible mathematically. So 1 is the smallest value of n that we're allowed to have. And when n is any one of these values, if we rearrange these values, if n must be l plus 1 or larger, then l can't be any larger uh, than n minus 1. So l can range from 0, 1, 2, et cetera, all the way up to n minus 1. So that version of the n and l rules uh, may begin to sound familiar from what you've learned about the hydrogen atom before. You know that there's a quantum number that it can be 1 or 2 or 3 and another quantum number that can range from 0 up to n minus 1.